you know, tractors, it's not like a car where tractors, they last much longer and they break down. So you have to prepare them and uh, it's common, it's normal. I mean, this we wouldn't have all this if it wasn't. So. There's an example of software. Everything has to go through that central computer and if it, one thing goes wrong, shuts the whole track, the whole combine down. See, software, it's everywhere. It pushes small farmers out of business. It pushes, pushes a lot of people out of business. They still break the same, so they still should be able to be fixed the same. Why did they stop doing this? That's the only question you need to know. All this is right here is new, software is this. That's all I want. I just want the book to tell me how to fix something. And uh, if they can do this on this particular issue with software, where are they gonna stop? In our globalized world, almost nothing seems able to escape digital control cadenced by electronic devices. Inaccessible to most of us, computer code dictates their logic. They are designed to simplify our relationship with the world. Their inventors apply the principle of the less we know, the more will remain captive customers and passive citizens. In so doing, they leave us ignorant of the battle taking place inside our machines as two models of society face off, the dominant world of ownership against the world of the common good. At stake in this invisible battle, to free up all knowledge shared by mankind by no longer letting a minority decide on its own the content of the codes it controls for its exclusive benefit. defibrillator that used to be in my body. Uh, it was implanted right here. Um, I have a new one. Um, my heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart. And um, I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. When my electrophysiologist meets with patients who need these defibrillators, he slides them across the desk so that they can feel them and say, oh, it's so small, it's so little, it's not a big deal. I can imagine having this in my body. But when he slid it over to me, the first question I asked was, what does it run? And he said, run? And I explained to him that these devices have software on them and that I would like to see the software or at least learn a lot more about it. And his response was, software? My software is literally sewn into my body and screwed into my heart, but it's just a metaphor for all of the software we rely on that is life and society critical. It's a very short walk from the software that is connected to my heart to the software that's controlling your car or the software in your voting machines or the software controlling the stock markets or the software that you rely on to do just about anything. And currently, we live in an age where we're building an internet of things. We're building a world where all of our software talks to our other software. We're using our phones connected to basically everything that we do. And in that world, we're only as safe as our weakest link. When I buy my technology, when I buy my phone, when I buy something, I want to be able to control it. I want to know if someone is spying on me. I want to know if they transfer that data to third parties. And I want to be able to change that technology in order to protect myself from nefarious actors. And there are many situations where free and open source software has been demonstrated to be a completely viable alternative to proprietary software. Since 1983, 
Freeing up computer code in the interest of all has been the fight of Richard Stallman, a hacker and a researcher at the prestigious MIT near Boston. He was the first to suspect that digital code would soon hold sway over a society that was becoming more and more run by machines. This has the name Bill Gates on it. The ritual is to give him the finger. So, want to join in? Yeah, yeah. Together? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. Most people get in using a digital lock. I refuse to open the doors in a way that tells the system who I am. And everyone should refuse. So I'm going to put some of my things inside, but uh, please don't come in. My office is private. My goal was to give freedom to every user of my code. How could it ever be free? It's free if the copyright holders declare that the users have these freedoms. It's copyright flipped over to become copyleft. You can't use copyleft as such. What you need to use is a specific license. So I wrote one. It's called the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL. And the declaration that the copyright holders make, we call a free software license. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. There are four essential freedoms that the user of software should always have. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program however you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it to make the program do what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to distribute copies of the program to others when you wish. Now this includes republication of the program. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. If you have all four of these essential freedoms, then the program is free software which means that the social system of the distribution of this program is an ethical system that respects the freedom and community of the users. If one of these freedoms is missing, then the program is proprietary software, meaning that it keeps the users divided and helpless and gives the developer power over the users. This is an injustice. If you want to have freedom, the only way you can have it while using computers is by rejecting proprietary software. We want to give all users of computing freedom in their computing, which means that their computing is under their control. And that means there's no proprietary software anymore. Stolman had a fascinating insight, an insight that wasn't just in the realm of software code, it was in the realm of legal code. He did judo on the concept of copyright. He used its strength against it. He did judo because he took the rights that were um, intended to lock things up and he used them to make things open. He was the first to realize they were locking up software. Before that, software was generally free. What made the money was selling machines. The software was left to developers, and they shared it. They were real hackers. And when Richard Stallman realized they were becoming owners of the software, locking it up and cutting out the togetherness of this community of developers, he said, OK, we'll develop free software outside of this and against this. For over 30 years, Richard Stallman has been crisscrossing the planet, promoting free software, but mainly to defend the freedoms he feels are threatened more and more by technology. 
I suppose that almost everyone has chosen to carry a cell phone without realizing the injustices it contains. I see the cell phone as the dream of Stalin. What would Stalin have loved to give to each inhabitant of the Soviet Union? A device like this to track and listen to everyone. But the technology didn't exist back then, poor Stalin. His dream couldn't come true, but now it does exist. So I chose never to carry a cell phone. Controlling our own software has become an essential human right in order to protect other human rights. So you should escape from proprietary software and come live with us in the free world we have built. You know that it's dangerous to society when giant multinational corporations control a sector of people's lives. It's amazing how the people who are aware of this in other fields habitually disregard it when it comes to software. But it's just as dangerous in the computing field as in any. Making free software just so it's free has no meaning. You make free software because it upholds ethical and social values and because you can share these values with a number of people. But naturally, this software can serve everyone, a company quoted on the stock exchange or people managing a shared guard. Not leaving the control of computing in the hands of the coders alone is the ambition of a number of people's educational associations across the globe like here in Nantes, France, where they put free software into practice. Linux administration isn't my job, but it really needs to work. Everything based on Ubuntu is fairly simple. Either you go through a terminal, or you tell it manually to extract and install the software. Open, download. Today we're holding an install party. The aim is to install a free operating system on your computer, notably GNU Linux, instead of other proprietary systems that are sold with the computer you buy. We want citizens to understand the rudiments of these technologies so that these technologies can be opened up and so that citizens can then use their skills to run them. You learn how an object is made when you repair it. And then you realize there are problems regarding obsolescence and intellectual property. The question of free culture lies there. It's not just about developing free software to be used by a community of bearded developers. It's an eminently political and social issue in that everybody is concerned by this ever more technological and opaque environment. Proprietary software offers you a ready-cooked meal, just like you'd buy in a grocery store. You pop it in the microwave and shazam, you eat. Free software gives the chance to cook your own meal. Companies want us to buy ready-cooked, they don't want us cooking by ourselves. The epicenter of the digital revolution is the San Francisco Bay Area, which draws the world's best minds. Around Silicon Valley, computer coding wizardry has become one of the keys to success in this new capitalism of knowledge. Why we developed this thing? Because um, pharmacy software are not really efficient. And we also introduced UKR Pro, so it's a web platform for the pharmacists, which save time, keep track of business uh, of your business. We opened the first 42 school in Paris in 2013. And we've just opened one here in Fremont dedicated to learning how to code, writing in a language that computers understand, so we can have them do what we ask in this language. So we train coding professionals, those we call developers. 
Our interest in teaching them programming is that they'll have an effect on this world. They'll be able to create the digital world in which they themselves will live and which we all will be able to share with them. As the spearhead of free, the Mozilla Foundation has been fighting to keep the internet a common asset of mankind since 2003, and with success. Firefox, its web browser, free in both senses of the word, has several hundred million users throughout the world. And next we have Constantina in Berlin talking about the Firefox Quantum Sprint. We have offices in North America, Europe, and Asia. Also New Zealand and Australia. It's from the North Pole to the South Pole. We even have Mozilla people in Lapland. Mozilla is a global organization of volunteers and full-time staff. We have thousands of volunteers that contribute in a range of ways, everything from writing software itself, the Firefox web browser contains code written by volunteers, to marketing the software, to supporting end users with user support forums. We also have a full-time staff of engineers that lead the project and are responsible for charting the course for the Firefox web browser. There are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are trying to work on the same mission of keeping the web open, keeping it uh, open from the clutches of corporates, clutches of governments, and that's one of the reasons I contribute to Mozilla. Even though I don't get paid, I get paid uh, working on a day job, which is far different from what Mozilla actually does. But I come back to Mozilla at the end of the day, and I can sleep at peace because I contribute to Mozilla. In a way, the software is the matrix that forged the logic of free. But wherever intellectual property rights exist, you can reverse this logic. And the fascinating thing is, as this software is available everywhere, we also have the means to resist in all areas by reversing the logic of appropriation through intellectual property rights. This exists in the realm of data. There's a great project called OpenStreetMap, where people have created the equivalent of Google Maps by collecting data with what's called open hardware, where you can put equipment under free license by sharing blueprints. The hardest thing is tying knots with one hand. So I had to change the movements so I can tie up the horse. Stamp today, and prosthetics don't like water. We fiddled with this to try to hold the reins. But in the end, I hardly use it because it's badly oriented. So we'll have to start over. It gets stuck sometimes. But otherwise, Pretty practical for driving. The first time I put my prosthetic on, it went beep, beep. And I had a fond thought for Terminator. I was making pretty much the same sound. I tried to invent a whole lot of things with my friends, like things for sailing, you turning up with your gear, I'm like, cool, we're already on the same wavelength. Ours is a free model. We put our files on the internet so people can make it themselves. There's a connected electronic card in the form of a micro USB. It costs around 300 euros in parts for self assembly. Because it's free, you can enter into the hand's brain and modify the code to suit your needs. So I can make one, two, and three movements. And the partnership between the coder and my request has resulted in this. 
In just one hour, I was totally amazed as well. Okay, that was the free domain. Let's look at the industrial domain with a finished article. Whereas this is a constantly evolving open source project. And one day, this one might overtake this one. And the proof is that even today, we can command the rotation of the thumb, whereas here, we can't even turn the thumb. So in the end, you'll have a small part like this. You can tell it's a finger. So in fact, the finger goes here. Here it's in the middle. Could it possibly go into an outer position? I think it'll need a groove. Because if it keeps opening here, this will close and it'll do this. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's do it then. Okay, that's good. We're now in 2017, and Nicolas has a hand that was developed in 1980. It was invented in 1980. A brand new prosthetic hand like the one Nicolas wants costs 40,000 euros. He's lucky, in France he'll be reimbursed by Social Security. It's cool. But that hand is only worth 4,000. The 36,000 other euros, it's not right that 90% of the prices to pay for upstream R&D. On smartphones, you only pay about 2%. So our idea is to give the community blueprints. And then if they find our fabrication method a bit complicated, they'll improve it and reduce costs even further. So it's a virtuous circle. After that, we'll have to find some money to pay ourselves one day. We'll give that some thought. Google.org is our sponsor. So naturally, they use us for inspiration. That's fine. If in exchange they give us the freedom to exist, then they've understood everything. Understood that by opening up to open source, they'll benefit from creativity and communities. The free software movement started because of a set of ideals. Open source is the notion that this is just a better way to make software. The two can be compatible. The free software people want to never lose sight of the ideals. The open source people say, this is just going to make a better browser, a better operating system. And so now Google, working in its own self-interest, says, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to have this open source, which means everyone can use it and we tie our hands. We can never make this private. They are pre-committing to say this will be free forever. And thus Motorola or Samsung can say, okay, we can use this because we know Google will not take it back. That's done for very pragmatic, profit-driven uh, motives. The first time I switched on the autopilot, I was scared because I saw the car accelerate and I couldn't control it. The car just sped up on its own. Now if I ask it to overtake, I don't touch a thing and it switches lanes. It's a real comfort. You get used to it pretty fast. If a car came out with the same quality but open source, personally I'd go for the open source car, just for philosophical reasons. We realized that at Scality, we were using a lot of free software to make our own products. When a free competitor arrives, they're always not as good to start with. Then, over time, with all the user contributions and ideas, the product improves and the software improves. My view is that in the long term, any software will be caught up by free software. The value isn't in the code source, but in the community. I think that free has already won. I don't think that owners can win this battle. In your pocket you have a smartphone, it's probably packed full of free software. Your TV box is packed full of free software, but there's only a part of free software that we call open source. To us, the free software militants, free software is open source plus ethical and social values. There exists what's called closed logic, which says that the code itself has a market value, a monetary value, and so no way it will be freely accessible to people. In contrast to that, there are people who say, no, we want to work in free because all human beings should have access to this code and should be able to read it. 
To them, freedom of access is absolutely fundamental. Then what happened is capitalism. And this is perhaps something Karl Marx observed, that capitalism is extremely flexible. It knows how to adapt. So back in the 1990s, there was a kind of little fork where some people said, we'd like to benefit from your code, but we don't want all of our own code to become free. And this resulted in the invention of a new so-called open license, with the friendly name that echoes a little bit the term free, where people said, if we take your code and put it in our program, your code will remain free, but we'll do whatever we like with our program. They expected that free software would fade away. They expected that I would join them in presenting this business-friendly discourse, which was designed to win some support for business, and I agree, it's useful. It's a fact that almost all open source programs are free. Uh, the differences in what they say about the values and goals we're working for. Capital, Silicon Valley, corporations, are trying to monetize the shared wealth of the internet. The kinds of things like uh, personal data, the kinds of things like free and open source software. Technology is a serious tool by which capital likes to enclose common wealth. A major tool of capital is intellectual property, as it calls it, to try to get monopoly control of genes, of seeds, of creativity, of information, of data. And so there's this vast grab to privatize and enclose uh, by using intellectual property. Companies are experimenting with these new ways of privatizing knowledge in every field in an attempt to stretch even further the limits of proprietary logic by even speculating on the ecological crises of the future. Welcome to Aero Farms. We're at our global headquarters in Newark, New Jersey. This is a very industrial area, and it's a site of a former steel mill. So the soil here in the city, a lot of toxic metals, don't have to do any remediation because we actually grow indoors all year round. This is actually taking controlled growing to a new level. The idea that we can bridge what's called good agriculture practices and good manufacturing practices and set a new standard for farming from seed to package and do it in a better way. constantly monitoring their sensors and we can look at the plants this is something on like day three we can know what's gonna happen on day 10 day 12 of its harvest and this is a way we can get up to 30 harvests a year and have local production all year round at Aero Farms we have a very uh, robust IP intellectual property strategy so we have patents uh, for example even around our growing medium there's some things we want to leave as trade secrets so we don't help educate our competitors. So the financial opportunities are tremendous. It's one of the reasons why we've been able to raise over $100 million in capital between our corporate and project financing, working with partners like Goldman Sachs. And the idea is how we address global issues, weather change, increasing population, and have a disruptive business model. More than 800 million Indians still live in the countryside, far from the uniformed world of private disruption. They're at the heart of a natural diversity, now threatened by the never-ending expansion of high-yield, productivist agriculture. But here, in the north of India, they have chosen to preserve this diversity. <laughs> We're preparing for the next harvest. We've taken out the seeds for the next season. 
और सब्जियों का बीज देर ऑल्सो वेजिटेबल और जाते हुए आप दरबान सो एस्क माई वर्कर्स विच वराइटीज एंड विच क्वान्टिटीज यू वॉन्ट देखते जाइएगा धान की किस्मों को They want to go back to their old varieties because what is available from the government is only corporate non-renewable varieties and varieties that are failing. When I started Navdhaniya, it was very clearly with the recognition for seed freedom to not allow seed to disappear in a way that we had to buy Monsanto seeds, GMO seeds, patented seed. This is a very, very ancient wheat called Mundi Pisi, very old wheat, as old as farming, an ancient variety. These are the kinds of varieties that Monsanto was trying to patent. We fought them and we have we, we got them to withdraw that patent. Monsanto is a rent collector from seed. Microsoft is a rent collector from software programs. Each and every one of the billionaires of today and the big corporations of today are rent collectors. Gandhi had called this the worst sin, to have wealth without work. BASIC was developed by university professors. Recombinant DNA was developed by university professors. Microsoft took one, Monsanto took the other. They took tools that were in the public domain and found in intellectual property a way to privatize them and increase their role. There was an American company that got a patent on basmati rice. Now, if you talk to an Indian, he will say uh, he grew up uh, eating basmati rice. If that patent had been sustained, it would mean that every time an Indian ate basmati rice, he'd have to send a check to Texas uh, to pay off the patent. There was no innovation here. It was just somebody clever uh, saying, nobody has gotten a patent on basmati rice and I'll get that patent. Pure rent seeking. And this rent-seeking logic is being imposed on a global scale from Geneva, a stronghold of intellectual property since 1995. There's the United Nations. This is something that one time it could have been the League of Nations, but never was. The World Trade Organization is uh, down that direction. The uh, taller building here, many people think this is the UN building because it's uh, it's a very striking visual. It's very tall. That's the World Intellectual Property Organization. And it's, uh, it's I'm here this week for negotiations on uh, copyright. They produce treaties that set the level of protection on everything from seeds to trademarks, patents, copyrights, all these different areas. Uh, it's very historically very much dominated by lobbies from corporate interest. They actually have kind of a conflict of interest in that respect. Uh, the more patents that are granted, um, the more money that agency has to play around with. Their job is essentially to account money uh, and not to produce things. And it's not headed in a good direction. It's headed in terms of more and more enclosure and less and less uh, rights for the public. The law is being made by the market. Innovation really <clears throat> is the basis of competition now. Uh, we live in a world in which innovation represents the competitive advantage. In order to have that innovation, you have to have investment in innovation. And in order to have investment, you have to have economic incentives to encourage that investment, namely intellectual property. And there must be an economic model for obtaining a return on investment. Now, every year at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, more than three million patents are filed and made legal on an international level. And intellectual property now accounts on its own for 20% of the creation of global wealth. WIPO spreads a confused idea that there is something called, quote, intellectual property, unquote, 
which supposedly is something in common between copyright law and trademark law and patent law and trade secret law. It's a confused, meaningless generalization about things that are not similar. The three fields where especially patents must be eliminated are agriculture, medicine, and software. In the case of medicine, uh, it blocks generic medicine, thus making medicine too expensive for millions of people who may then die. Actually, I haven't done this in a, in a while, so let me check. Having diabetes is always being in a precarious position with respect to your health and your survival. So one of the nice things about diabetes is you always have to carry a bag of supplies around with you. So, you know, I have my man purse and um, some insulin, uh, blood glucose meter and test strips for determining how much sugar is in my blood information I then use to determine the, the dose of insulin to take. So here on my belt, I have uh, my insulin pump that leads to this catheter that is, is here in my skin. There are just a few companies in the world that make insulin, and I'm dependent for my survival on uh, the goodwill of these, these kind of alien entities, these global corporations. I want greater control over the technology that keeps me alive. Maria, introduce yourself, please. <laughs> hey guys, this is Maria over at BioCurious. Um, and I am most interested in trying to figure out how we can partner this project with other groups that want to work on it internationally and doing outreach and marketing about how we can better try to create an open source product and actually bring it to market. This is our community biohacker space where we are working on making open source insulin. All the three major manufacturers that operate in the West raise the price from 15 or $20 a vial to hundreds of dollars a vial. Insulin has been produced since the 1920s, so companies have known how to make it for quite a long time. And yet prices keep on rising, which is kind of funny. But purifying it is something quite complicated, because although the protocols are simple, they're naturally all patented. So the whole debate is on finding a way of getting around the patent. All molecules with a size greater than 3,000 Daltons won't pass through. So it's a way of concentrating the samples. We can produce pro-insulin, but we can't get a sufficient yield to turn the pro-insulin into insulin. In the early 1980s, there were three huge industries, pharmaceuticals, big pharma, media, and entertainment, and the fledgling information technology. And they all said, our real business isn't selling products, it's managing the knowledge stored within these products. These three would soon be joined by biotechnology industries, and from then on, they would create a knowledge economy. When I bought the product, I bought the rights of the person who put the knowledge into it. Okay, we'll set a guidance on here for straight line. This way I can focus my attention on the ground and see what kind of job it's doing. This one has a lot of computers behind me. And there's two up in the engine compartment at the back of the combine. They want control everything. We're locked in. We are definitely locked in. We are in big trouble with the John Deere dealer and uh, Bayer. The seed that I plant comes from that big company. And the combine I own comes from one of the biggest 
agricultural corporations in the world. So, software and seeds. Yeah. He lost 30 days during harvest last year because they couldn't get a computer that's on a 2005 combine. So he had to wind the engine clear out. Now, this is a brand new tractor. Even they told me last year, they can monitor the problem from the store, you know, off the satellite. And I said, oh, well, that's nice. He says, but you got to sign up for that. That's $1,100. Oh. And if there was an update that we could get, we could fix it. But they won't give us the software. So he's got a larger capacity machine, but with that, you've lost consumer rights. You've lost the right to fix it, to repair it, and now you're losing the right to modify it with the extended use license agreement. Is that progress? These tractors are computers on wheels. That's all they are. At least you buy a computer. They used to give you a backup software disk where you could reboot it from day one setting and take off. We don't even have that. So LB67, the spirit of that law is to make programming, diagnostic, and repair software available. Political society exists for the sake of noble living. At this place, at least we got a chance to get our bill passed that gives us the tools to fix our own agricultural equipment. Well, who could be against farmers working on their own tractor? It's almost unbelievable that we have to ask for this, this right. This is my legislative seat. I represent District 16. And I still get emails and calls from all over the world wanting to know about this bill, what will happen. They said that hackers would come in, that Nebraska would be a mega for hackers because we would be the only state that would have this law. Intellectual property is protected. It should be protected. However, innovation is on the horizon. You know, who is to say what the future will hold? You know, little did we know, you know, there was going to be a light bulb or a telephone or, you know, a motor vehicle. I mean, innovation, I believe, with uh, one foot on the brake isn't gonna go anywhere. You know, we need to get that foot off the brake. Above all, we need to defeat the political power of business. It is the plutocratic state dominated by business. For instance, trade treaties, they reduce the power of the people over their own state by transferring that power to businesses. They give businesses more clout against the state because the business can always say, we'll move our operations to some other country unless you give us what we demand. Following successive waves of relocations to Asia over the past 20 years, the vast city of Bangalore continues its rapid expansion. Its status as India's capital of high technologies and digital have seen it flourish. Because here, the average salary of an engineer is 10 times cheaper than in the West. The key to the city's success? A young, highly qualified population. But not everyone can climb the social ladder. Of the 12 million inhabitants of Bangalore, over one third still live in shanty towns. So I think uh, we'll go forward. These people had struggled a lot uh, to settle here. This area consists of around uh, 300 families. And these people, they had no permanent jobs. Uh, they had to struggle a lot for their food. It is considered a slum. Even right now, we don't tell it. This is IBM. It's a proprietary software symbol. We do not prefer this company. 
So this is libre, not gratis. This is free software philosophy, kind of. Libre is nothing but a Spanish word, freedom. This freedom is like, we are freedom. We don't want to stay as a slave. And uh, this is a community center, AC3, Ambedkar Community Computing Center. Hello. The main motto of this center is like, the slum people should have a knowledge about computer. Since 2008, this community center has been open to children from the slums trying to escape from their condition through computers and free software. Here, free software is mainly seen as a tool for emancipation, in the service of everyone. Computer studies is more than just learning how to use software. Here, I can also learn what they don't teach us in school. In school, they don't really teach us many things at all. But here, I learn so much more about everything. I currently work in an IT company. I was dropout kind of students. Everything I started with free software, I can say. Speaking with the volunteers of free software members, attending seminars, this and that. So I learned from many volunteers. I need to give back to the community. With intellectual property, knowledge generates money. But only for a minority of people, and they make a lot of it. At the heart of digital technologies, there is a logic written in codes, and this is a question of knowledge. We should be asking how do we create a modern learning society where people are advancing the frontiers of knowledge and everybody is moving up to those frontiers of knowledge. But our patent system is impeding both. It's making it difficult for those to get access to knowledge so that they'll be brought up to the frontier. And unfortunately, it's even impeding the pace at which the frontier moves up. In this time of climate change and cascading environmental crises, uh, we're not going to find solutions through more growth. Uh, the solutions are going to come through new types of social and political organization. And that's going to be incubated at the small level and local level first. You put yourself in the middle. You have a row of carrots there, and you go up like that, and back like that. I have 76 files. We're starting to have an interesting variety of tools. We developed them from the ideas of peasant farmers, so it's only natural to go back to them. The tools are all available in open source on our website, and anyone can make them their own. Okay, we have six different parts plus a clamping nut to be soldered on top. These six parts, one to six, must all be welded together. Look ahead of you, it's not centered. It's really important to know how to make things, because in today's society where we consume and consume, there are times when you have to make choices and teach yourself to be more self-sufficient. To us, free tools really means free tools. And that's why open source at Atelier Paysan is a means and not the end. We must find a way to tell people that these tools are collective and that anyone can appropriate them. We must also find a way of ensuring these tools are never privatized, confiscated, or patented. Basically, we must guarantee that these tools are collective and remain so. That's how we define these farming tools as commonwealth. It's faster, and it won't damage your back. Naturally, free can create jobs. I think we're proof of that. We're between 60 and 70 percent self-financing, and 30 to 40 percent state subsidies. It's because we consider we're producing commonwealth and that the collective must take its share. Because free doesn't mean free in the financial sense, but we do need money to keep the whole thing going. 
It shows that civil society can also be productive. It's something we tend to forget. We simply see the state and the market, and next to them is civil society made up of consumers. In fact, no. Digital Commonwealth has shown that people in civil society can get organized and take charge of the production of resources, which can be of equal quality to those produced by market players. The battle for free today is to transpose what was a great success in software to the entire digital system, and then, after the digital system, to transpose it to all new forms of the creation of Commonwealth. It's this logic of sharing that will be the driving force behind emancipated societies. And this driving force is germinating in our exchanges in the social media, in our uses of digital, in our experiences of Commonwealth, which are gradually being implemented everywhere. There are the beginnings of a new society experimenting on a daily basis. This is certainly a fine victory, the safeguarding of our fertile lands, of our wetlands, with all of their diversity, and the questioning of decisions taken with no respect for local populations. It's the support of each and every one of you that has enabled us to push this project back as far as abandonment. Welcome. Thank you. Without the collective strength of all the militants, and especially that of our neighbors, we farmers wouldn't have dared stay in our homes illegally. So without those occupying the land, a desert would have been created around us. 60, 70 living places. Uh -huh. Many other people are not farmers, they have diverse activities. Yeah. So we don't want it to go to like industrial ag yes. agriculture. So these are zones of freedom. Sure. And that are needed. Mm -hmm. The light uh, house, there is also a siren. A siren? Okay. This was all common land where the farmers would take their cattle to pasture quite freely. And now the whole area belongs to the state. But this actually means that the question of ownership isn't an issue. And that's great, because for us, although we occupy this land illegally, we assume that illegality. So we can put in place more and more uses of the land in a fairly free, self-sufficient way, beyond the fences of private property. Land is defended by those who live on it. We are going now in Les Sandons, which is the living place where I live. Okay. We came here and we installed everything. The, the house, the garden. This is this one? Yes. Hello. Sweeter? Uh, I think so. And uh, it's also practical to cook it because you do not need to peel it. We have exploding climate change. We have societies disintegrating because nobody knows what a community is. And the end of the logic of enclosing every aspect of our life, whether it's our mind and our brains and our knowledge or our work or nature's commons, the end of it is extinction. So if we have to have a future, if you have to have life, that life has to be in the commons. When I come here and watch all of you <laughs> baking your bread <laughs> and making your woodwork, this is the future that all young people should be able to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are a lab that shows how the future can be cultivated through reclaiming our place on the land and our humanity through creativity. And just like we're sitting in this building, which has a lighthouse, this area has been turned into a lighthouse for how we should be living. Mm -hmm. 
ensuring the logic of sharing by allowing each community to rediscover full control of its knowledge to better meet the climate challenges we face today. Could it be this which is really at stake in the sharing revolution? People are important. Whatever age you are, please join in our fight. If you want freedom in your life, and if you want other people to have freedom in their lives, and this should include using digital technology, then you should start fighting for it.